All right, a pleasant good morning to everybody. And it's good to be in the house of God at this time. At this time as we begin, uh, let's turn, take our hymnals as we turn to hymn number uh, 400, hymn number 539, hymn number 539, when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace, hymn number 500. And thirty nine. <clears throat> Father, Lord, we help us, O oh Lord, to take advantage of the times in which we live, the freedom 
that we have in this country, Lord, to, pro to propagate the gospel of grace. Lord, I pray for every church. I pray, Lord, for every minister, Lord, who would dispense the word of God this morning. Father, I pray that your word would go forth with power and great conviction of the Spirit of God, that you would use your word in a mighty way to challenge and to change the hearts of your people. And not only us, O Lord, Father, but the unsaved, Lord, I pray that somebody would come to know you as Lord and Savior today before time changes to eternity. Lord, have your will and way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's continue to sing as we turn to hymn number 355. Hymn number 355, I heard an old, old story. Our Savior came from glory. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> oh, story, our Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save us. Victory beneath the cleansing 
the Lord. This morning as we <coughs> take our scripture reading, as we turn to the book of <coughs> Matthew, the book of Matthew, <coughs> One second there. <coughs> the book of Matthew chapter number 10. The book of Matthew chapter number 10. And uh, we look at verse 37 through verse 42. Matthew chapter number 10, reading from verse 37 through verse 42. Shall we all stand? in respect of the word of God today. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking here and he says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it he that loseth, loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Verse 42 tells us, And whosoever shall give to drink, Unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Alright, so we want to thank God for his word this morning. May the Lord bless and honor his word at this time. As we sing a couple choruses, let's sing. As the deer panted after the water brook, so panted my soul after thee, O God. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. Do you? Yes, Lord, yes, 
I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart and agree and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. I say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart I'll agree and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. At this time as we just take a couple of announcements uh, very quickly before we go into the word of God. And let's remember to pray for each other. Let's continue to pray for all our believers. And let's continue to pray also for churches like Precious Faith. Continue to remember those who are without a pastor, resident pastor, some uh, like Cornerstone Charity Baptist Church. Uh, their uh, pastor is stuck outside of Trinidad, uh, but still have a great uh, impact upon their lives. So we want to thank God for them. And uh, by God's grace, let's continue to remember those uh, these brethren and these churches in prayer. Let's also remember uh, Bannister Baptist Church. Uh, let's continue to remember Anchor Baptist Church, Amazing Grace, um, Fundamental Baptist Church, Family Baptist Church. Uh, let's continue to remember all our churches like Precious Faith, uh, by God's grace, as we continue to serve the Lord together in this twin republic, by God's grace, I trust that we will have a great impact upon this country as we continue to propagate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, and also at this time, um, we saw the news yesterday, something that was very disturbing, and um, five people were gone down yesterday in the Carapo area. Uh, those people were known to us, some of them, we know them personally, uh, a lot of them, we know them personally, by God's grace, I, we pray for the families uh, involved, we pray especially for the Sukraj family. Uh, let's continue to remember them in prayer and this time of mourning for the Poon family. Uh, this time, uh, by God's grace, we are saddened by what has taken place and uh, this village at this time has known much, much tragedy over the years. I trust by God's grace. Uh, I am from that village. I grew up most of my life in that village. I attended the church in that village. I got saved in that village. And we preached the gospel, we witnessed in that village. And the many of the young people who died to, uh, yesterday, uh, many of them attended Sunday school, many of them we taught in Sunday school. And uh, by God's grace, they have taken their own way and uh, we pray for the families of that um, uh, tragedy at this time. And um, I trust by God's grace at some point in time we'll, be, we'll go over and, you know, just uh, minister to them and bring a word of encouragement by the grace of God. All right. We don't know the extent of um, the, the circumstances involved, but by God's grace, we, our prayers are with you all. And uh, we lift you up in prayer at this time. Father, we give, you, we give you praise. We give you all the honor. Lord, we pray for these families at this time, Lord, who are going through a time of mourning. Father, we do thank you, Lord God, that even in such a situation like this, we could still look to you. And Lord, look for your guidance. Look for your wisdom. I pray, Father, O oh Lord, that you would so lead, O oh Lord, the authorities, the police, O oh Lord, and those involved. I pray, Father, O oh Lord, that you would so make sense out of all of this, O oh Lord. I pray, Father, O oh Lord, that for the families in question, Lord, we pray for them in a special way that you would comfort them. Father, I pray, Lord, that your word is able to bring courage. Your word is able to give stability in the midst of storms and trials and testings. Father, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would so have your will and way in their lives. I pray, O oh Lord, that they would, uh, you would lead them as you would continue to speak to them. I pray, Lord, that they would give heed to your word. Lord, have your will and way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. All right. Um, next Friday, next Friday we will have a prayer meeting, an all-night prayer meeting. And by God's grace, we are continuing to pray for the lost souls of men and women, boys and girls. An all-night prayer meeting, men only, starting uh, this Friday night. And um, as we continue to pray 
and deliver and um, lift up this community and the environs and uh, the various ones who will be joining us uh, for that all night prayer meeting. I trust by God's grace we'll have a wonderful time before His presence as we meet Friday night at 7. All right? At this time, as we take our Bibles once again and we turn over to <coughs> our scriptures, <coughs> we just read from the book of Matthew chapter number 10, Matthew chapter number 10, and at this time as we go over to the book of Luke chapter number 14, the book of Luke chapter number 14, reading verses 25 through 20 or 35, the book of Luke chapter number 14, <coughs> Reading from verse 25 through <clears throat> verse 35. As you give as we give, as I give you a little minute to turn there. Luke chapter number 14, verse 25 through 35, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking again, and he's talking about the cost of discipleship. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother, and wife and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whatsoever, and whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. And again in verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 34, salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out, and he, he that hath heirs to hear, let him hear. Father, bless your word. We thank you, Lord. May you hide me behind a cross. May the Savior be highly exalted. I pray, Lord, that you would so empty me of the self, of pride and arrogance, ignorance. I pray, Father, O Lord, that the Spirit of God would have free access. I pray, Lord, that the Son of God would be highly exalted. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And amen. As we look at this solemn subject this morning, it was the German theologian Dietrich in his book, the Cost of Discipleship, published in 1937. In his book, he defined cheap grace as the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. He says, cheap grace is the baptism without church discipline. He says, cheap grace is communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, it is grace without the cross, it is grace without Jesus Christ. Notice the emphasis is on the benefits of Christianity without the cause involved. Hence the adjective cheap he described. Cheap. This morning by God's grace, we don't have cheap grace. We have an amazing grace. We want to thank God for the amazing grace of God. But today we live in a world where the grace of God is suited and tailored to fit the needs of modern man. It is so far removed from what Jesus described to us in the scriptures this morning. And as we look at the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we examine the text, we will be able to understand what he means when he says to his disciples, if any man come and whosoever doth not bear his cross cannot be my disciple. Those are plain spoken words. Those are dogmatic statements. Those are words that he's not mincing words here. He's telling the truth and he's telling it like it is. The Lord Jesus Christ wants his disciples to know 
there is a cost involved when it comes to following me. Of course, in chapter 13, he is answering the question of one who is following him. He says, there are there few that be saved? And he answered and said unto them, enter in at the straight gate. So he's answering the question of this particular disciples. And he goes into chapter 14 and he gives a rather radical statement when it comes to being a disciple. The demands of Jesus the cost of discipleship. The songwriter says, I wonder have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me. I wonder have I done my best for Jesus. I wonder have I done my best for him. Jesus demands three things of his followers. Jesus demands three things from his followers. He demands a commitment, he demands a cross, and he demands a cost in verse number 28 to verse 32. Let me share with you very quickly this morning. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is the claim of many of many people who darken the doors of the church today. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Some people say I am a follower of Jesus Christ and they take it to mean the same thing. But there is a vast difference between a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. We will look at that in a little while. If we say we are his disciples, here are the conditions, the stipulations, the demands of Jesus. It's not just the demands of the church, the church is not demanding this, uh, the pastor is not demanding this, the deacons are not demanding, demanding the, 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 the qualities or the stipulations of being a disciple. It's not the elders or the bishop of a church who gather together and says we want a disciple to be X, Y, and Z. They themselves, we ourselves, are disciples of the cross. And the same thing applies across the board to every person who say they are willing to follow Jesus Christ. But the demands of our Lord himself, it's the demand of our Lord himself. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. First of all, he demands a commitment. He demands a commitment. He demands to be loved first. He says in verse 25, verse 26, If any man come to me, if, he says, there is a condition, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, children, wife, children, brethren, sisters, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, the Lord is saying here, he does not mean that one should hate as in the true sense of the word that we know it. He doesn't mean to hate your family members, your wife, and to hate your own flesh. He's simply saying to love less. In other words, he's saying that I should take first priority I should be the one who should be loved the most to be placed on the first order of your list of love, so to speak. Your first mode of attachment, the first one that you attach to would be me. It's demands of Jesus. He demands a commitment. Total love. He says to love less. Your father mother, wife, brother, sister, and your own life also, he says when it compares to me, that I must be placed first. Who is demanding total love? Uh, to be loved first. That's the place that we all want to be. I want to be the first place in my, in my relationship with my wife, uh, but as a Christian I realize I should not take play first place. And my wife says that I, I love my husband, but I should not be the first place in her life. I should not be the one 
who will occupy first priority in her life. Uh, those who have children, your children shall, should not be the, the ones on your first priority, your list of priorities. The first one that you love, it should be him. Some people, we live in a world where self is looked to. We need to lift up ourselves. We need self-realization. We need to look at ourselves more. We need to do so many things, but this flesh is corrupting us. Matthew chapter number 22 and verse 37. Matthew chapter number 22 and verse number 37 here is the Lord Jesus Christ and he's speaking to his disciples answering the scribes and Pharisees as well from verse 34 and he's making this statement Jesus said unto him thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy mind this is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Lord Jesus Christ summed up the entire body of law in just two commandments. He says, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. 613 laws are hanged on these two commandments. Love for him and love for your fellow men. Love for him and love for all fellow men. Who is requiring this type of love? Who is the one should we should put first place in our life? The Lord Jesus Christ said himself and he's quoting the Old Testament scripture and he's going back all the way to the commandments which says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Now, he's quoting the Old Testament scripture. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ affirms that one should love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. But now he comes over in the book of Luke and also in the book of Matthew. And he says to his disciples, You must love me first. What is he saying? Is he contradicting the scriptures? Who is this person that is making such demands that we love him first? It is affirmed by Jesus in the New Testament. The love demands an inner spiritual righteousness that is expressed in the outward justice and the holiness and in our, in our everyday life. That's what he demands from the nation of Israel. Now here in Luke chapter number 14 and Matthew chapter 10 and the other scriptures, he is demanding what is rightfully due unto Adonai. What is rightfully due, first place, that is due to yod he vav he of the new of the Old Testament. Who is Jesus? Now he comes and he says, you should love me first. He says if you have on your priority list any other attachment, if you love anybody more than you love me, you are not worthy of me. Who is Jesus to demand such from his disciples? Could I tell you this morning that he is the creator? Could I tell you this morning that he is our redeemer? He is the sweet rose of Sharon. He is the Malek. He is the king. He is the prince of all princes. He is the governor of all governors. He is the shepherd of our soul. He is the bishop of our salvation. He is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He is the mighty God, the everlasting father, the, the prince of peace. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is demanding from his disciples that there be Love him first, above all else, period. It's not negotiable. This is exactly what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob demanded from them. 
the Old Testament scriptures, the prophets, this is exactly what the Lord Jesus is demanding from his followers today. Love him first or don't love me at all. He is the one who approached the ancient of days in Daniel chapter number 7. Try to wrap your mind around this one. You can't fathom him. He is demanding total love. He is demanding total loyalty from his disciples. He says, if any man will come after me, there is a choice to be made. If any man will come. He wants everybody to come. He says that he's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he says that you do have a choice if any man would come. In Revelation, he addressed the church and he says to them, you have lost your first love. Repent. Repent. Come back to your first love. Come back to me, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. Come back to me, the Aleph and the Tav of the Old Testament. This is the one who is demanding your love and our love and our loyalty. It is the God of the Old Testament in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who is demanding from his disciples, if you're going to come and follow me, then you must realize that there is a commitment to be made and without making that commitment, without determining, to make, determining in one's heart and mind that there is a commitment, but not only there is a commitment, but secondly, there is a cross involved in following me. There's a cross involved in following me. He says to his disciples, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, excuse me, cannot be my disciple. Can't be. Those are strong words. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. If I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus is saying he demands a commitment and he says that he demands a cross. Well, tell me, what does the cross really represent? What does the cross represent? The cross represents in that day and time, it represents subjection. It represents subjection to Roman law and authority. That is what the cross represents. So the Lord Jesus Christ is using something that they could grasp, something that they understood, something that they be, beheld with their eyes. A person hanging on a cross is subjected to Roman law and authority. He's not his own. He has been conquered. Not only subjection, but total humiliation. The cross represents humiliation. It is to humiliate the person who is carrying or hanging on a cross. The Bible tells us, curse be the one that hangs on a tree or hangs on a cross. Public humiliation. So when he says, he that Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Who doth not, doth not bear it cannot be my disciple. He says, you must be willing to be subjected. You must be willing to suffer humiliation. And you must be willing to suffer crucifixion at the point of death. Those are the claims and the demands of Jesus. He is not claiming something that he was not willing to be. Do you know that he, you understand that he himself was first to go on the cross? 
Do we not understand that he demands this of his disciple, but he was the first one to go upon a cross and to suffer subjection, humiliation, and crucifixion? Because he's giving us an example to follow him. He's our ultimate example. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, he demands a cross from any of his disciples. <clears throat> he demands a commitment. He demands a cross. The cross results in victory and glory for Rome. They have conquered their enemy. Anybody who was opposed to Roman subjection, those who opposed to Roman law and authority will be humiliated, will be even to the point of crucifixion and death. And it is to show the public that anyone who defies Roman authority will, be, will suffer the same fate. That's what the cross represents. The Lord Jesus Christ, if anybody would come after me, by God's grace, we must be prepared to bear a cross. Even if it means death. As you look at first century Christianity, many have died. Many have given their lives for Christ. Yes, they have given their all for Him because they understood that He was first priority in their life. And that beyond this mortal life, there awaits them a glorious life offered to them by the person of Messiah. And he proved it as he died on the cross, as he was risen again, but three days after, he says to them, I will resurrect you one day. Whosoever shall lose his life, for my sake shall find it. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, fasting, in everything, Pray without ceasing, the Apostle Paul says. We ought to be in constant prayer. We ought to give ourselves to him. The Bible says, the Lord says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That's the demands of the king. He demands not only a cross. He demands not only a commitment. But he demands a cost. There's a cost attached to it. He gives two examples, one of a builder and one of a king going to law, to war, from verse 28 to verse 32. <clears throat> In today's world, parents would do their utmost best to provide for their children education. As a child comes into the world, there is a tremendous amount of responsibility, financial responsibility, emotional responsibility. There is a new, there's a, a certain amount of responsibility that is uh, dropped squarely upon the shoulders of the parents to see this child through this age of childhood and adolescence and the teenage years, bringing them into a place in life where they will be able to stand on their own two feet. But by, by, by God's grace, there is a demand from the parents. There is a cost attached to raising children. And parents gladly would give whatever and sacrifice whatever it takes to see their children reach an age of maturity that they can hang themselves in life and make good decisions. A teenager that sits down and counts the cost of accomplishment. His life's goals, his dreams, his aspirations, 
He sits down and he plans or she plans his life because he wants, he wants to know exactly that when I reach this age that I have accomplished X, Y, and Z and by God's grace I want to know what it would take me, what are the sacrifices that I have to make, what's the cost that I have to pay in order to arrive at my goal and my destination in life. There's a cost attached to it. A man and a, wa and a woman, and I specifically mentioned man and woman, I'm not saying a couple, today everything is really fine. A man and a woman about to be married sits down and count the cost of the wedding. They sit down and count the cost of the food, the rings, the guests that they would invite, the place that they would rent, every single thing that goes along with planning that wedding, the cost of the honeymoon, whatever it may be, they sit down and they plan for this wedding because there's a great cost attached to it. It's a demand from the parent, the teenager, it's a demand from the man and the woman who is about to be married. But how is it? But how is it that we would do that for everything in life, uh, but don't do it when it comes to discipleship? Why are we buttering up and sugarcoating and masking what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? For far too long, churches, we are selling a cheap and easy believism that is not consistent with biblical Christianity, with the claims and demands of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is not selling a cheap Christianity, but one that is far more exceeding expensive above anything that you could ever think or imagine. It is not the average Joe who would just say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I believe that he died and I am saved, I'm going to heaven. It's not as simple as that. It's as simple as making that first commitment. But it goes far beyond that. There's a cost. There's a cross. There's a commitment that is attached to following Jesus. That is attached to being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in a world where this Christian Christianity, mainstream Christianity, has painted a picture for people that is not consistent with biblical Christianity. Come and sign on this dotted line. Just say a prayer, and you're automatically on your way to heaven. You don't have to live the life. You don't have to do what the Bible says. Just try your best. As long as you think it's from your heart, just try your best to live as best as you can to follow Christ and Christ will honor that. That is okay with him. That's not what he's saying. He says, if any man desires to come after me, count the cost before coming. If any man decides to be a disciple of mine, then first of all, you must be totally committed to loving me. And that love that you have for me will be a cross for you because it will be a burden all the days of your life when it comes to your relationships. Father, mother, brother, sister, wife, and even your own self also, it's the cost that you have to be willing to pay. And that cross you must carry all the days of your life. But it's a cross that you and I do have to bear on our own. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. So the Lord Jesus Christ is not telling us that in order to become a disciple, 
You have to carry this burden all by yourself. No, it becomes light when you place it all on him. He says, yoke yourself to me. Yoke yourself to me. I am the major one. I am the one who's carrying all the load. Your burden becomes light when I am carrying all the weight. And here is the difference between a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. A simply a mere follower of Jesus will be concerned with his own blessings, will be concerned with just following Jesus so what he can get, his advancement in life, his love and loyalty is for the world, is for the flesh and for the prosperity of this life. That's what a follower of Jesus does, a mere follower. A mere follower of Jesus' foundation is built on sand. It's built on sand. It's not based on the firm rock of the Lord. He is not the rock of their salvation. A mere follower of Jesus here, but he has a problem with execution. He has a problem with the commitment. He has a problem with the cross bearing. He has a problem with the cost that is attached to being a disciple. And so he, he hears, he, he's with the crowd, he's with everybody else, he's want to be with everybody else, but really and truly, in fact, he's just a follower, but he's not a disciple. Who is a disciple of Jesus Christ? A disciple, however, here is the difference. A disciple, however, hears and follows. And it's committed. The Lord says in Matthew, John chapter 10 verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, because they are hearing my voice. A disciple as a student, a disciple is concerned about the souls of men. A disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned about his life, is concerned about his conduct, is concerned about his effectiveness in serving his Lord. He's concerned. In Matthew chapter number 28, verse 19 and verse 20, the Lord Jesus says, he gives two words to his disciples as he's sending him out. He says, go ye therefore, and as you're going, you want to share the word, but he used the word teach and teaching. The word teach, he says, go into all the world and teach all nations. It's the word Matthew, and it means to make a disciple of. It means to instruct with the purpose of making a disciple. It's not only to learn about, to become attached. In other words, that involves being attached to one's teacher and becomes his follower in doctrine and conduct of life. So you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are putting your foot in the master's footstep and you're following him because you are his disciple. His disciple. And he says to his disciples, Go into all the world and teach or make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. In other words, it takes time for one to become a disciple. Initially, it starts off by making a commitment. But it follows a cross and it demands a cause. Following Jesus means being a disciple and then making disciples. In other words, you have a firm knowledge of what he has done in your own life. You understand the word of God. You say, preacher, but what about if someone can't read or write? Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so therefore this individual 
as a disciple, as he hears and listens to the word of God, he wants to be obedient to his master, wants to be obedient to his Lord because he's a committed individual, because this is what his Lord demands from him. And by no doubt, he wants to make disciples of people that he would meet because he's, he's faithful to the task that is ahead of him. How long have you been a Christian? How long have you say, have you said that you were a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ or are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? How many people have you won to Christ since you come to him? Do you understand what he's saying? Do you understand what he's demanding from his Disciples, not from the followers. The Bible tells us that the multitudes were following him. And he says, if any man desires to follow me, and he lays down the ground rules, the stipulation, his demands for being a, a disciple of his. But he not only uses the word Matthew, meaning to teach or to make disciples of. But all, he also says, teaching them to observe all things. The dasko, it means the thing aimed at when one is teaching. The shaping of the will. As though one by communication is using his knowledge that he has, whether it be by personal experience or what he has been taught from the word of God. And by God's grace, he is teaching and trying to shape the individual he's trying to make a disciple of. God is using him as an instrument to make a disciple of somebody else. That's the goal of this individual. That's the goal of this disciple. That's the goal of the child of God. It is to make a disciple of all nations. It's the goal of Christianity. It's the goal of being a child of God. I believe we have, as a church and as churches, we have been far too long making a very cardinal mistake in just inviting people to come to Christ and don't take the time to make a disciple of them. Don't take time to make a disciple of them. It's a failure on the part of the church. Why we love the fanfare, why we love the crusades, why we love all of the excitement that goes along with it. A disciple is one who painstakingly goes by that individual knocks on their door, sits with them, and give them the mind of God over a period of time and make a disciple of that person. It takes commitment. It takes sacrifice. It takes love to do that. A disciple is one who does that. By God's grace this morning, are you just a follower, part of the multitude, or are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Who are you this morning? Who am I this morning? I trust by God's grace that we would be excited as a disciple of our Lord, our Savior. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm not simply a follower, but I am one of his disciples. I am willing to suffer shame, humiliation, rejection, whatever it may be. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word. Lord, your words are clear as crystal. Help us, O oh Lord, by your good grace to understand what you are saying to us. I pray if there might be any this morning who are confused. I pray, Lord, that you would so help us to reach out to them and as they reach out to us, that we would try to help them and point them to you. 
the Lord, that we will so be of service, O Lord. Help us by your grace to be faithful stewards, to be a disciple of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen and amen. God bless you, God keep you, cause his face to shine upon you and give you this peace. See you next week Sunday by God's grace where we'll meet another time around the world of God. God bless you.